Hello, my name is Scott Pearson and I am the EMEA Independent Director of Sales at Farpoint Data. I'm over here based in Europe to support and help all of the Farpoint partners on this side of the Atlantic. For this 20 minute session, we're going to discuss Farpoint's newest Connect BLE Reader platform and explain why we're so excited about this latest development for the access control business. To understand why we're so excited, we need to look back and review the evolution of reader technologies that have brought us to this latest product's offering. Technologies like Magstripe, Wigan, Proximity and Smart Cards each had their heyday and each had their own pros and cons that we have used to help develop our mobile access solution. So let's start this with a quick review of our latest product offering, Connect Mobile Access. By now I hope you've all been introduced to Farpoint's Connect BLE platform. To quickly summarize though, Farpoint's Connect mobile access platform represents the latest evolution of reader technology for the access control industry. It is hassle-free BLE that is really simple to implement with a recognizable business model our industry is familiar with. Farpoint has replicated the existing plastic card business model with mobile credentials to make it easy for our partners to adopt. There's nothing new or complicated to learn. It incorporates high-end clone-proof AES encryption, and it also incorporates high-end DESVAR EV2 clone-proof smart card technology. BLE, or Bluetooth Low Energy, utilizes your mobile telephone and makes it a high-security door entry card, capable of opening doors from a distance. We all have our mobile phones with us at all time, so adding door security to the phone certainly seemed like a logical addition. Certainly, if you've attended a trade show in the last few years, the whole industry is buzzing about mobile access. Everyone seems to think it has great possibilities. So why is there so much excitement about mobile access? Well, for a start, we've got industry consultants predicting one in five cards will be mobile within the next five years. That is a powerful prediction and an exciting starting point. But is it gonna be the next great innovation and does it actually add value to the access control business model? Let's be honest, the bottom line is, is it gonna help you to sell more and can you make money selling mobile access? Let's better understand the other re-technologies our industry was built on to help appreciate how and why we've arrived at Connect. The journey begins with Magstripe technology. In the early 70s, IBM first laid a high cohesivity Magstripe onto a plastic credit card. Magstripe cards were relatively affordable and unlocked access control for the masses. <clears throat> so what did Magstripe address? Based around standards created by the American Bankers Association, ABA Track 2, it gave us a technology that could be easily programmed and could retain its programming. It was an access solution we could carry in our wallets or purses, and with an insertion or with a swipe, it could unlock a door. The public perception was that if the banks used these cards for dealing with large sums of money, they must be secure. But was it? Despite the perception of security, magnetic stripes actually had no protection over their programming. Any suitable Magstripe encoder could take any Magstripe card and easily copy its programming onto another Magstripe card. That wasn't ideal, and Magstripe had other issues as well. Magstripe readers had magnetic heads that attracted dirt and these needed cleaning periodically. Furthermore, the reed heads used to wear out and need replacing. The Heiko stripes themselves could lose their programming with repeated use. We've all had that walk to back to hotel reception where we can't get into our rooms because the card isn't working anymore. The alternative to Magstripe were Wigand readers and key cards. You all know the name, but what was Wigand? Well, in the early 70s, Dr. John Wigand had patented the ability to get a small magnetic field into a wire filament that were dubbed Wigand wire. Using Wigand wire, center engineering was able to lay strips of wire in a specific pattern on a plastic card and effectively pass the strip through a magnetic sensor and interpret the spikes it saw as ones or zeros. This produced a simple binary code that would become the basis of the Wigand format. When sensor engineering laid 26 Wigand wires onto a card, they produced a format that would become an industry standard for the next 30 years. 
So what were the advantages of Wigand over Magstripe? Wigand key cards did not actually have to physically connect with the read heads to read. It was actually promoted as contactless and it certainly reduced the wear and tear and the need for servicing. Wigan cards lasted longer than Heiko Magstripes. The biggest advantage of all was Wigan security over Magstripe. Wigan security could best be described as security through obscurity. There was only one company in the world making Wigan wire, only one company who could manufacture and encode the cards, and that was sensor engineering. So the cards couldn't be copied or cloned like Magstripe cards. This is where the idea of Wigan 26-bit being the benchmark for security came from. Sensor engineering was able to manage who got what facility code and controlled card distribution, maintaining its security. However, Wigan wasn't perfect either. The cards were really expensive and typical orders could take over eight weeks to be delivered. Furthermore, as the cards were numbered before manufacture, it was common for there to be card dropouts during the production process, so sequential numbers could not be guaranteed. Jointly, however, both Magstripe and Wigan shared a common issue that prevented them from being the ideal access control solution, and that was convenience. Both technologies needed you to get a card out and swipe or insert it, and do so at the correct speed and orientation get it wrong and it didn't read. For all the benefits access control brought to the owners of businesses, it actually was the end users themselves that became the key deciding factor in buying the access control solution. When you had to swipe and insert cards, this could create an inconvenience, particularly if the user was carrying something or if there was multiple people trying to go through the door. When that happened, it just became easier to bypass the access control system. Doors could be wedged open, people would tailgate, and many of the USPs of the access control system, like tracking users, were diminished. It became clear that happy users were essential for access sales to grow. And ease of use was a key element that neither Magstripe or Wigand were able to address. In the late 80s to early 90s, numerous companies had an answer for this and started working on the idea of contactless RFID readers and cards. The first commercially available contactless reader and card solution for the access control industry came in the mid 80s from companies like Indala and Hughes Identification. RFID or radio frequency identification utilized electromagnetic waves to transfer data wirelessly between coils. This RFID worked at low frequency, around 125 kilohertz, and became widely known as proximity due to the fact that the cards could be read in close proximity to the readers without needing to insert and swipe the cards. Compared with Magstripe and Wigand, this was a key game changer. Prox technology had no moving parts, no wear and tear, and no servicing required. It had cards that were easily read every time without misreads. But the key upgrade over Magstrap and Wigand was the convenience factor. Prox made it easy to get through doors. It had a typical read range of 4 to 12 inches. In fact, users could leave cards in wallets or pockets and still get read. This meant happy users, which meant happy customers. It comes as no surprise then that during this present period in the 90s, Access Control experienced its greatest heyday and sales boomed. The cards could be programmed with sequential numbering without dropouts. Lead times rapidly reduced till they were days rather than weeks. As volumes increased, the prices came down. So they were lower than even the Magstripe equivalent. Even the, the cards eventually be, were able to become ISO standard credit card size and could be used with die sublimation printers. This early proximity worked with a special custom-made low-power RF silicon chip. In fact, for as long as these companies had control over the RF silicon chips, they had their own security through obscurity, and they controlled their card distribution and formats, maintaining its security. Hence, they were thought of as being highly secure. Speaking of security, there is one important point that needs to be made and understood 
about the innovation of proximity, and that is what it did to Wigan's perceived security. To maximize the commercial opportunity, Prox companies made their readers emulate the two most used access control communication protocols, namely Magstripe and Wigand. As far as the access control system was concerned, they knew no difference. At this point, Wigand format no longer had the protection of only one company in the world making it. Cards could be programmed based on software, not hardware limitations, and Wigand lost its exclusivity, which lessened its security. That all said, throughout the 90s, RFID proximity seemed a perfect marriage with access control and the industry experienced exponential growth. However, its success led to a commercial chip manufacturers like Atmel and Electromarine starting to produce low cost RF silicon chips. In turn, this led to an explosion of proximity manufacturers and it wasn't long before devices for field programming of Prox cards and then also card cloners began to emerge. This threatened the perceived security of proximity, and particularly in Europe where, where contactless cards were being used for cashless payments, vending and transportation applications, the fear of card cloning became a real issue. This opened the way for smart card technology to come into the security industry. The first smart card technology everybody probably knew was MyFair, and it was developed by Philips Electronics, although it's now called NXP. Rather than just having bits of storage data, MyFair cards could store kilobytes of data. It had encrypted card to reader authentication that required a special security key to unlock. This meant no data was transmitted between card and reader unless the security keys were accepted and the security handshake was completed. The data that was then transmitted was also encrypted and secure within the public airspace between the reader and the card. That said, the first instances of MyFair usage in our industry was using its card serial number or UID, unique identifier. This electronic serial number was by design stored outside of MyFair security encryption and anybody could read it. Actually, it had no more security than a prox card. But if you were using MyFair cards as intended with security keys and sectors, it was definitely a step up in the card security from its prox predecessor. The MyFair card was divided into sectors, a bit like individual drawers in a filing cabinet. Each sector could have a different bit of data, so it was considered multi-application. MyFair did have its drawbacks, however. Kilobytes of data traveling between card and reader came at a price. The carrier frequency needed to transport the larger amounts of data could no longer be 125 kilohertz. It had to be faster and 30.56 megahertz was chosen. This higher frequency was badly affected by metal and interference. So installation of MyFair readers had to be handled carefully or read range could be lost. As it was, the MyFair read range was only one to two inches to begin with, but it could be almost contact if the installation had a lot of metal or noise present. Also, the speed of read was slower as the security handshake and data transfer took much more time. In 2008, the unthinkable happened and MyFair was cracked. Essentially, there were so many MyFair cards being used in vending and transportation applications that the hackers couldn't resist. Each card was effectively storing money, so being able to copy cards was like printing money. Once they cracked it, MyFair joined proximity in having the same vulnerability to card cloning. As with Prox cards, encoders became available where you could clone and reproduce MyFair cards, including all of the sectors and even the UID. This was a major blow to the smart card industry. Philips NXP reacted by increasing the security levels and created DESVAR, which ultimately evolved into DESVAR EV1 and EV2 and introduced 128-bit AES encryption. Ultimately, if you had DESVAR EV1, EV2, Legic, or any of those advanced smart card technologies with AES levels of encryption, you definitely have card technology that cannot be cloned. You've certainly addressed the card security issue. However, smart cards, due to their short read range, lost that element of convenience that had been so key to the access control success previously. 
So what have we learned? Almost every technology had a key advantage over its predecessor. Whereas security satisfied the customer, it was convenience that satisfied the actual end users themselves. The contactless proximity era brought the greatest combination of security and convenience and access control prospered under its greatest period of expansion. This was no coincidence. Prox cards and MyFed cards can now be cloned and companies are exploiting this in their attempts to win sales. Smart cards indeed brought card security and encryption and can be clone proof, particularly with AES 128 bit encryption. But due to the issues with 13.56 megahertz frequency, they have lost the read range and the convenience that the customers expect. Which brings us neatly back to 2020 and Connect Mobile BLE. And my original question, why are we all so excited about mobile access? Connect employs AES clone proof encryption, whilst at the same time offering up to 30 feet of read range. It has enough security to satisfy any bid specification targeting card cloning threats. But it also has the convenience of read range that was missing from smart cards. With Apple and Android smartphones now fully integrated into our daily lives, adding Connect BLE greatly increases the chances of end users having their security credential with them at any time. They are more likely to leave their card behind than they are their phone. We've included the ability to have branded cards with custom graphics and messages on the mobile credential. Cards can now be delivered electronically and distribution is simplified without sacrificing security. The no shipping or importation costs. We have specifically created a mobile credential business model that replicates the plastic card business model of the last 30 years. We have done so to provide the greatest opportunity for our partners to make money selling mobile credentials. With Connect, our customers buy our mobile credentials and they own them. There are no subscriptions, no annual fees. Finally, the beauty of an app-based mobile platform is that updates and improvements and security enhancements are real-time and live and can be done via the app stores without the need to change the hardware. The technology can literally improve and develop as you're using it. This makes it as future-proof as we can make it and we believe that mobile access is going to be around for a long time. The last time our security access control industry got a te technology that addressed convenience and security happened to be its greatest period of growth. That's why we're so excited about Connect Mobile Access. We believe it will do it again. That concludes this brief overview of our reader history and our technology advances. I trust you found it useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact your local Farpoint representative. Alternatively, there is a wealth of information and data available at our website at www.farpointdata.com. Finally, if you are looking for even more in-depth information on Farpoint and our solutions, there are plenty of other presentations for you to see at our YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.